Hey, there's only one spot left. For what? For the VBS sign up. I wanted to sign up for that. Could you take me? Church is real close. It's all mine, buddy. <laughs> Come on. Open it. took the last spot on the volunteer sign-up sheet. Oh no, there's always more room for volunteers at BBS. Should we tell him? Nah. today. Uh, register today. Again, um, they've got all the information up there. You can register uh, at our church website. If you'll just go to fbccenter.org uh, slash uh, VBS, uh, it's that easy. You can register today. Uh, we want you to register by today. Well, actually, I think Rhonda said she's going to give you an extra week. So you got one more week to register in order to get a free t-shirt. Um, also want to mention that this month has a Fifth Sunday in it, and every Fifth Sunday we've been trying to give a spe special offering to our building fund. Um, so if you would like to do that, uh, please be in prayer about maybe what God would encourage you to do or to give um, to our building fund. We'll be taking that up on May the 29th. And then this is a real cool one. You, you're going to want to listen to this. Um, Miss Teresa Fagan, and I think her Sunday school class is going to see the Rome Braves play, I think, today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Today, yeah. Uh, and uh, she's got four extra tickets. So um, don't move yet. But at the end of the service, uh, if you want to go to the Rome Braves today, they've got four extra tickets. Please see Miss Teresa Fagan. Uh, and uh, she'd be glad to just give those to you. Um, so anyways, uh, listen, we're glad to see you. If it's your first time with us, we would love to connect with you. We do that through our connection cards, which is over there on the table. Um, and we also have gift bags because we just want to show some love to you today and say thank you for coming and hanging out with us. So if you could do that today, that would be great. Uh, and uh, again, you'll hear probably Brother Eddie say this at the end, that we still need you to stack chairs eight high, even though I won't come back up at the end and do this again. All right, so uh, please stay, stay with us afterwards if you can, those of you who are faithful servants in the Lord Jesus Christ, to stack chairs every Sunday and roll them to the back, okay? Uh, let me pray for us and we'll begin our service. <laughs> this is what I heard. Huh? Yes, we've announced BBS. They, just want they want to announce it. Oh, yeah. Oh. 
On the count of three. One, two, three. Yes. Yeah. Woo. Let your voice be heard. All right. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Um, God, you are so great and, and awesome. And God, would you please just help us? God, um, help us to, to slow down, to, to enter into your presence. Um, God, to come come into this place, uh, God, in such a way that we're desperate to meet with you today. Um, God, help us to be dependent on you today in these, in these moments. Uh, God, help us to, uh, God, just uh, get to a place where this just isn't just another thing to do. But God, this is something that's ne that's a necessity to God to meet with you today and and try to maybe sing a song and and try to listen just for a few moments, just to hope and hope that we might hear from you today. God, your presence is all that matters in these moments, and so God, please be here. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lance. Well, all right, let's worship the Lord. It says to put your hands together and let's make a joyful noise with that. So let's kick this service off. We're talking about drenched in love, and some of you may not know what drenched is, but it's a real good thing. So let's go right here. And everybody help out. Right. Young folks upstairs. Let's go. Let's make a joyful noise. Are you glad to be saved? Are you glad to be drenched in love? Here we go.
Yeah, I was buried deep with Christ my Lord and now I'm raised to life forevermore. My name's been carved upon your heart. Don't oh, I dare, don't oh, I dare to live. Praise you, God. Praise you, Jesus. Let's raise a hallelujah in this place. Amen.
is alive. And he shed his blood on that horrible cross so that we could have eternal life. And so that we could have a relationship with him now, not waiting till we get to heaven, but even now to have that relationship. And Lord Jesus, <laughs> Lord Jesus, we thank you for shedding that blood, your blood on that cross. Please receive our worship. Lord, you're so holy, incredible, incredible. But we thank you for your blood.
Dismissing children at this time, and as you see, they're up at the walking track. If you're with us visiting and uh, your child would like to go, if they will exit this door back here, there'll be some that will escort them upstairs and get together with the rest of the gang. Amen. Praise you, God. Somebody give him praise this morning. Hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, praise team, for leading us in a time of worship today. And, and listen, God is good. Amen? Amen all the time. Praise his name. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, Lord, in these moments right now, Lord, would you just remind us even again of who you are? We thank you for the blood of Jesus, which cleanses us from all sin. Father, we know where we came from. Lord, we know what you saved us out of and what you saved us from. Glory to your name. Father, right now, would you bless this time? We thank you already, Lord, that our hearts have been blessed this morning and our, our spirits stirred this morning. But, Lord, now as we look at your word, would you stir our hearts? And, and Lord, I pray for help. Pray for help by your spirit. In Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said... Amen. 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 If you have your Bibles today, we're in the book of Acts today. Acts, the sixth chapter, and we're looking at a, at a, a man by the name of Stephen. We mentioned Stephen last week in the first part of the book of Acts, uh, chapter six. Uh, he was one of the early servants. Uh, many think maybe some of these were the early deacons of the church. In any regard, they were chosen to serve. They were chosen to, uh, uh, to serve the tables. The widows were uh, some widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food, and so Stephen was one of those guys. And, and so today we're going to look at his life, and, and uh, I just entitled it to, to be like Christ, to be like Christ. And, and I'd like for just a moment, just to, if we can go just, to, uh, just to back to the latter part of, of Acts chapter uh, 7. Let's go to Acts chapter 7, and, and just some things I want us to, to think about as we look at here to, to be like Christ. And let's stand together as we read just a portion of God's Word here for just a moment together. And we'll be looking at all of it here in just a moment. But, um, but Acts chapter 7, and starting with verse 54, 54 of Acts chapter 7 says, When they heard these things, they were enraged and gnashed their teeth at him. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven. He saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. They yelled at the top of their voices, covered their ears, and together rushed against him. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And after saying this, he died. This is the word of God. You may be seated. You may be seated. Um, you know, in thinking about Stephen uh, being like Christ, and we'll look, there were several 
several things I think we see of how that he reminds us of Jesus. You know, of course, I, I grew up in Kentucky, and uh, I know I mention that all the time, and I love Alabama. Please don't get the wrong. I love Alabama. And when I was back last week in Kentucky, it was revival. It was fun seeing my daughter and grandbaby and some friends, but this is home. And But growing up in Kentucky, you know, you just almost have to at least be partial to basketball. Uh, I mean, I just don't know any other way to say it. It's, it's a great uh, state, a basketball state. Football, not so much, as you well know. Uh, but anyway, basketball, uh, not so much either here lately, but even still. But point, growing up, loving basketball. And what you may not know, back in the day, Back in the day, I, grew, I was born in the mid-60s, grew up in the 70s and 80s, low, early 80s. And, uh, but anyway, but the point being, we had an ABA team, a pro team, uh, the Kentucky Colonels. And, uh, and I say that because up top here, Jack Waters, his wife Cindy, Brother Jack, you played in the ABA, didn't you? Stand up, brother. Listen, this guy played at Ole Miss, also played in the ABA, the NBA, a pro basketball fan or, or player right here. I'm just a fan. He's a player. And, and man, we appreciate you, brother, and Miss Cindy, and glad y'all are here. And But you know, to think about it, I grew up watching the Kentucky Colonels, and we had some guys like uh, Louis Dampier and uh, Dan Issel, Artis Gilmore, and, and I, had, I had this high equipment, high-tech equipment. Some of you may have heard of it. It was called a Nerf basketball. Anybody, anybody ever heard of that? Anybody have one? How many of you guys played Nerf basketball? How many of you guys played this morning before you came to church? Anyway, but I used to, and I, so I would pretend I was one of the Kentucky Colonels. And so I'd take the ball out by bouncing it against the wall, you know, as a Nerf ball. And I would go down, and usually Dean would be three, two, one, and, you know, sometimes it went, sometimes it didn't. But I idolized those guys. Oh, man, I want to be like one of those guys. If you grew up in the 90s, there was a player that played, that played for the Bulls that was pretty good, a number 23, by the name of Michael Jordan. And a lot of folks wanted to be like Mike. In fact, that was a commercial. Um, I want to be like Mike. And, and, and a lot of guys would try to imitate Mike, you know, and dunking the ball, tongue hanging out. You know, of course, he could jump from the top of the key to the basket, which... Well, anyway, besides that, but anyway, we would try to imitate Mike, but, you, but we couldn't. But the thing is, there are a lot of sports heroes, other people that we would love to be like and say, I want to be like that person. But as a believer in Christ, is there anyone else greater that we ought to be like than Jesus? Is there anyone greater, more spectacular, more wonderful, more amazing than Jesus? I mean, to think about that, you know, and, and we ought to want to be like Christ. Uh, today we come to a guy by the name of Stephen, and, and Stephen had a lot of similarities. He, he walked, listen, he walked after Jesus. He's not Jesus. He, he's, uh, Stephen was like us. He, he's not perfect. Like, Jesus was perfect. We're not. But, but there's a lot of similarities. In fact, when you look at his life, he was falsely accused just like Jesus. He had a mockery of a trial just like Jesus. And even when they were killing him, Listen, he, he, he uh, prayed for his defenders. Lord, don't hold it against them, right? He held no, no animosity in his heart, even when they were killing him and, and stoning him to death. All those things, he prayed for the Lord to receive his spirit, just like Jesus committed his spirit. And, and all these things we see in the life of Stephen, that he certainly was one that, that lived and died like Jesus. Now, here's the question. What about you and me? If you take a snapshot of your life last week, the things we said, the things we did, the things we thought. How much were we like Christ? Now, none of us are perfect, okay? Jesus, but, but still, don't let yourself off the hook too much. And I won't either for me. How much of our life? Listen, as someone said, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you, <laughs> right? And, and so as you think about your life last week, is, is there enough evidence in your life of the way that you acted, of the way that you spoke, of the way if people can see your thoughts, the Lord can, right, of the things we thought? Was it like Christ? Was it like Jesus? I want to give you three things today as we think about Stephen, three things about his life as we look at the, the latter part of the 6th chapter and the 7th chapter, and we're not going to be able to read every verse. Uh, there's a lot of scripture here today, but his walk, his words, and his witness. And that's kind of where we're going today. His walk, his words, and his witness. Was, was that like Jesus? If you go back to chapter 6 of the book of Acts, and we look, um, let's start with verse 5. This was from last week. 
uh, in, in, the, in the sixth chapter, verse 5. And again, uh, Stephen was one of the early deacons chosen to serve. Testing, one, two, there we go. Uh, this proposal pleased the whole company, so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. So here it is, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Now look at verse 8, verse 8 of chapter 6. Now Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. So here's a guy, uh, it says, first of all, full of faith, right? He believed God, he trusted God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, but, but here he's full of faith in that he believes God. He believed the promises of God. He believed the, the word of God, right? The things that were being taught in the scriptures. And so here's a guy that is, that is walking with God, full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. Listen, this is not something just for, uh, you know, one person among many. You know, this is for every believer to be full of the Holy Spirit. This is a normal Christian life that we're filled with the Spirit of God. Nowhere in Scripture are we commanded to, uh, to be baptized in the Spirit. That happens at conversion, but we are commanded to be filled with the Spirit. And that means to be under the influence, under the control of the Spirit of God. That means every day of our life, we ought to be allowing Jesus just to direct our thoughts, direct our paths, direct our comfort, everything we're doing. So here was, here was Stephen. said he also was full of grace. He was gracious. Right, he was gracious. There was something, there was something winsome about his life. When you when you saw this guy, you just there was something about him, right? That that he even his very life pointed to Jesus. He was full of grace and and and, and certainly full of power. And now the power came from the Holy Spirit of God. The power came because this guy walked with the Lord. Have you ever been around somebody that you didn't have to be around them long and you could just tell this person knows the Lord? Have you ever been around somebody that you think, wow? I think this person talked with Jesus <laughs> this morning. I think this person's walking with Jesus. And, and that's the kind of person that Stephen, Stephen was. Well, look in verse 9 uh, of Acts chapter 6, verse 9. Here's the thing. We've been talking about it since the, since the get-go, almost, of the book of Acts. Opposition arose. May I say it again? I've said it about every week since we started the book of Acts. Anytime God starts working and doing a work in people's lives, working through his church, just expect the enemy to show up. Just expect that. Expect the enemy to show up in your lives, uh, students, adults. Expect the, the enemy to show up in your relationships, in your marriage, right, with your kids, the parents, the grand, whatever it might. Just expect opposition. Opposition arose. However, from some members of the Freedmen Synagogue, composed of both Cyrenians and Alexandrians and some from Cilicia and Asia, and they began to argue with Stephen. So here's a group of folks, uh, religious people, uh, legalists probably, um, we could say that, uh, religious people, and they were arguing with Stephen. Verse 10, but they were unable to stand up against his wisdom and the spirit by whom he was speaking. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we heard him speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God. <gasps> we don't talk about Moses. Notice here what happens. When they tried to argue with him and it didn't work, they tried plan B, right? The enemy will do that. Slander. Slander. How many people of God, right? How many folks, believers, followers of Christ, have been slandered against? And it's just a good word, a reminder, even for us as, as Christians even, that we need to be careful what we say. You know, the devil could use us to say something hurtful, that it could say something that could hinder the work of God in some person's life if we're not careful. That's why we need to guard our tongues, and I don't do that like I should, and I have to repent more than I want to, uh, to be honest. But, you know, maybe that's the reason the Lord gave us two ears and one mouth. Maybe we should talk less. And I know you're saying, Eddie, that'd be good for you, and I'll try. But anyway, but the point is, we heard him speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God, verse 12. They stirred up the crowd and the elders and the scribes. So they came, seized him, and took him to the Sanhedrin. They also presented false witnesses who said, this man never stopped speaking against the holy place and the law. For we heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses handed down to us. And all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at him and saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So here it is, they come upon Stephen. They seize him, it says, right? This was not a, this was a violent takeover. They seize him, they bring him before the Sanhedrin. Again, mockery trial, kind of like Jesus, right? They bring him before this, they slandered against him just like they did Jesus and all those things. And so they bring him here, but they notice that he's not, 
He's not frowning. He's not mad. He's not cussing. You know, his face was like an angel. The Spirit of God was all over him. Listen, and the Holy Spirit of God will give you and me just what we need at just the right moment. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't study and prepare, no. But, but in those times of life, have you ever been somewhere and, and, and the Lord just give you just what you need at, at that moment? I remember one time having a funeral and, and my goodness, uh, uh, the dad had been killed in a car wreck and he had leaned over to save the daughter and caught the gear shift and, and she's there on the front row in, in a cast and I just remember thinking, Lord, what am I going to say? I really don't know what I said. But I got up and stuff started coming out of my mouth and I thought, hey, that's pretty good. I hadn't thought of that. But, but God did. And God, God will always give you what you need. Amen? And so here with Stephen, his face was like a face of an angel, uh, it said. Um, you know, to think about uh, that opposition, think about the signs and wonders. I, 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 miss, I missed that there in verse, verse 9. You know, I'm going to tell you, listen, God's still God. He's still in the miracle business. Do not diminish the power of God. Amen. Listen, that, uh, I had a friend tell me this story this week. He said, uh, he said it, was, it was somewhere at a Cracker Barrel, and it uh, may have been in Kentucky, but anyway, he was, he, he was telling me, he said, uh, at a Cracker Barrel, this guy, I don't know what happened, had a heart attack, something, whatever, he stopped breathing. Well, there were some sisters there, Christians, they gathered around him, and one of them happened to be a nurse, and so the, the nurse started working, and she looked at the others and said, Sisters, pray. Well, they started praying. You know what happened? That old boy started breathing again. He had stopped breathing, and he started breathing. Now, we're quick to say, well, the, you know, medical this. I don't, maybe so, but I'm going to tell you, there's one on the throne that is Dr. Jesus that can do what nobody else can do. And so whatever it is, I'm just saying, signs and wonders happen. And sometimes Baptists, I know we're Baptists, and, and but sometimes we just need to clear out a spot and pitch a fit because, listen, God is God, and there is no other. And he is worthy of all praise. Amen. <laughs> So, we see then Stephen, right? Here he is. We see his, his walk. Also, we see his words. Let me move on. Chapter 7. Chapter 7. Now, there's a lot of chapter 7. In verse 1, it says, Are these things true? The high priest asked. I don't think the high priest really cared, to be honest, because they probably already made up their mind, uh, just as they had with Jesus. Verse 2. Brothers and fathers, he replied. Here's Stephen. Listen, the God, of, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he settled in Haran. And said to him, leave your country and the relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Now, here's what I want you to see. Now, there's a lot of verses in chapter 7. We're not going to read them all. Whew, aren't you glad? I want you to see something, though. As, as Stephen begins his defense or his speech, his sermon, right, as he begins to tell them, he's going to recount the history of Israel. So if you'd like to know what is a good history of Israel, well, Stephen's going to get, recount the history of Israel starting all the way back with Abraham, okay? And he's going to come, uh, and then he'll also mention Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, and he'll talk about Moses. Listen, the hero of the story is not Abraham. The hero is not Joseph. The hero is not even Moses. The hero of the story is God. Now, there's three things. I want you to get this. Just write it down in your mind, on a paper, or whatever. Three things in his speech that I want us to think about. First of all, and, and, and here's what he does. He, can I come down? I've, I've stayed up here a few weeks, and I'm struggling. I'll be honest. <laughs> Thought I was on the price is right there for a minute. <laughs> da -na 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 -na. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, brother. Where was that? Three things. Three things we see in his speech that sacred cows, are you familiar with that term sacred cows? You know, it could be like an idol, right? An idol, something that you idolize. Sacred. He's going to hit on three sacred cows of the people of Israel. One is the land, the land, okay, the land of Palestine. The second is the law, and especially the lawgiver, Moses. And the third is the temple. And he's going to show how that God is greater than the land, God is greater than Moses or the law, and God is greater than 
the temple. And that's, that's where he's going. So I'm giving you the cleft notes here because we don't have time to look in depth at all these verses. But, but we see then that's exactly what he does. So, so he starts out with the land and he talks about Abraham, right? And, and we told Abraham to leave your country and relatives come to the land. I will show you. If you look in verse 8, it says, And so he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision. After this, he fathered Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. Right, then in chapter, or excuse me, verse 9, verse 9 of chapter 7, he talks about the patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into slavery. And then if you move on down, he talks about Moses, verse 20. Verse 20, at this time Moses was born and he was a beautiful in God's sight. He was cared for by his father home for three months. Here's the point he's making. Abraham was not in Palestine when God called him. He was in Ur of the Chaldees. In fact, God called him and he settled in Haran, and then God had to call him again, and he finally settled in Palestine, even though it was never given to him. He mentions also Isaac, and he mentions Joseph. God did his best work in the life of Joseph, not in Palestine, but if you will, back in Egypt because Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. Moses was actually born in, in, in Egypt, but God revealed himself to him at the burning bush, not in Palestine, but in Midian, there at Sinai. The bottom line is, wherever God is, that's where holy ground is. See, it's not about whether it's Palestine or whether it was Egypt or whether it was Midian or wherever. Wherever God is, that's where you and I need to be. Somebody once said, well, if Jesus wasn't in heaven, would you still want to go? Now, before you answer that, if Jesus is not in heaven, then it's really not heaven, is it? If the Lord is not in heaven, then I don't want to be there. I want to be where he's at. And the crowning, listen, the crowning point of heaven is, listen, that God will be with them and he will be their God and they will be his people and we won't need a temple. We won't even need the sun in the sky because the Lord God will be there. Amen? To be in the presence of God. Amen? That's good news. Are you walking with him? Are you in his presence daily? So the land. Here's the second thing, the law. Okay, he mentions the law. Um, if we go back um, in our scripture here, to, he mentions Moses, of course, verse 37. Now again, Moses was held in high esteem. And, and he was. The Bible says he's the most humble man. No one spoke. God didn't speak to anyone else like he spoke to Moses face to face. What a mighty servant of God. But they had come to where they almost venerated Moses. They almost worshipped Moses more than, than God. And so in verse 37, he said, This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers and sisters. He is the one who is in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our ancestors. He received living oracles to give to us. Our ancestors were unwilling to obey him. Instead, they pushed him aside. Moses, that is, kind of like Jesus. And in their hearts turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. And so he goes on talking about how they didn't even obey the law that God gave. Now, the law is good. But the law can't save you, right? Only Jesus can save us. We, the law shows us our sin. The law shows us how we are guilty. But the law cannot save us. And so they have put their, their faith in Moses more than the Lord. And then one more thing. We see the tabernacle or the temple. Verse 44. We're still in chapter 7. Our ancestors had the tabernacle of the testimony in the wilderness. Just as he who spoke to Moses commanded him to make it according to the pattern he had seen. And then if you come on down to verse 47, it said it was Solomon, rather, who built him a house. David wanted to, but God had Solomon to do it. David had shed too much blood, right? Verse 48, but the most high does not dwell in sanctuaries made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and earth my footstool. What sort of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what will be my resting place? Did not my hand make all these things? See, his point was, and God's point was, quoting there from Isaiah, that God is not bound by four walls. Here's what I think Stephen is saying. He's saying, guys, your God is too small. He's not bound by geographical regions. Wherever God is, that's holy ground. 
He's not bound, certainly, uh, or by the law. The law shows us our sin, but the law cannot save us, right? He is, he is not bound by four walls. Now, what does all this have to do with us? Well, it has a lot. Because sometimes we can think the very same thing that the people of, of Israel thought. Number one, listen, I love America. I'm proud to be an American. Listen, anytime I've ever left the country, I'm always glad to get back. And, and I love this place. But being an American will not save you. Living in America will not save you. Being born in America will not save you. Only Jesus can save you. The law. Sometimes people think, well, if I do enough good things, I'm be saved. Every other religion is based upon works. Every other religion other than Christianity, if you do enough, do enough, do enough, do enough, maybe you'll get in. Well, you won't. Even half of Americans polled some years ago said this, felt like over half felt that you could work your way to heaven. Let me tell you, the law is good. It shows us our sin. It shows us our sa that we need a Savior. There's only one way to be saved, and his name is Jesus. And, and, and then the final thing of, of being in the four walls, listen, sometimes people think, well, if I go to church enough, if I endure enough sermons, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe they'll get, listen, Listen, we're glad you're here today, by the way. But the point is, just being in church will not save you. Listen, just coming to church won't save you. As one old preacher said years ago, any more than driving your lawnmower in the garage makes it a car, right? You can drive it in the garage, but it's still a lawnmower if it's a lawnmower, right? And so the bottom line is, we, we need to be born again, right? We need to be saved. Old George Whitfield one time preached at a meeting. The first three nights, he preached forcefully. You must be born again. Second night, you must be born again. Man, he was laying it on. The third night, you must be born again. He was laying it on. Finally, the elders came to him and said, Brother, you preached three nights. You must be born again. Why? He said, because you must be born again. Apparently, he was not seeing what he thought he ought to see. And I'm telling you today, if you're relying on church membership, if you're relying on baptism, if you're relying on foot washing, I don't know, if you're relying upon something else, being born in America to get you into heaven, if you're if relying upon being here, signing a card, you'll never make it only by the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me holy? again, nothing but the blood of Jesus. I'm telling you guys, we know it here, but do you know him here? Do you know him here? Being around the South here, most of us, we know the right answers. It's kind of like kids in children's church. We know the right answer is Jesus, <laughs> no matter what the question may be, but do you know Jesus? Amen. Amen. So we see then he, he confronts those things. In verse 51, we're going to and, and move on. We're, we're, we're getting closer to done. Verse 51, he says, You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. Ouch. Ouch. He called them stubborn, didn't he? Stiff-necked. Um, they weren't listening. They weren't hearing. You always resist the Holy Spirit. You're always resisting the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. As your ancestors did, you also do. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They even killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You received the law under the direction of angels and yet have not kept it. You know, basically he ends this, he ends this and it's ended here. You know, he basically said, you're guilty. You're guilty. And, and, and you haven't done what you ought to do. Your God is too small. You've missed God. You've missed even when he came, the righteous one. When, he, when Jesus came, the one you claimed to know, he was here and you killed him. That's what he said. Let me say this before I move on. May our words always certainly be seasoned with grace, but may we always share the truth of how to be saved. I know as a pastor sometimes when somebody wants to be saved, it's awful easy if I'm not careful to kind of let up on their sin a little bit and just say, well, you know. Listen, the bottom line is, it's Jesus' standard, not mine, that we must repent of our sin to follow Jesus. And may I say even to believers, Christians, the Lord calls us to be holy. There's no place for sin in our lives. So may we repent of any sin and turn to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Here's one more thing. Here's his witness, and it all works together. His walk, his words, his witness. But look at verse 54. It says, When they heard these things, they were enraged and gnashed their teeth at him. 
Someone said as a preacher, you know it's a bad day when people are frowning when you're preaching, but it's even a worse day when they're gnashing their teeth. And that's exactly what was happening here. They gnashed their teeth at him. Verse 55, Stephen looked full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven. He saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now that's, 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 that's noteworthy, isn't it? Jesus is what? Standing. Most of the time we read about Jesus, he is what? Sitting. That's right, at the right hand of God. Right. He, after he finished the work of the cross, he sat down at the right hand of God because the work of, uh, of, of the cross was finished, right? It was finished. Uh, and there's nothing else to do other than trust Christ. He said, verse 56, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. You say, well, why was he standing? Well, I think Jesus has stood up to welcome him home. Here's the first martyr of the church. And I believe Jesus stood up because here, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you. What a beautiful picture when a child of God goes home, don't you think? And I don't know that Jesus stands up all, but I mean, he stood up here, didn't he? Just to think about when, when a loved one, at that, that day when it comes for you and me, when our time as believers to go be with Jesus, that we are welcomed into the kingdom. Aren't you glad of that? You will be glad of that if you know him. To be welcomed in. Standing, he welcomed, right? He welcomed him in. Verse 57. They yelled at the top of their voices, covered their ears together, rushed against him. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Um, and, they, and the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now, to think about it, they stoned him with rocks. That, he's... he's Stephen's probably a healthy guy, you know, so this is going to take a while. They've even taken off their coats so they can throw more rocks. What a terrible way to go. And they laid, their, they laid their garments at a young man named Saul. Who is that? Paul. Yeah, here he is. This is unsaved Paul. Live your life for Christ because there will always be a Saul in the crowd. And that Saul may be, become a Paul. You never know. Here was a hit man for the rabbis. We'll get to Paul soon enough. But here he is. So the later, he's approving of it. He's, he's in for it. He may have thrown a few rocks as well. But what, a, what an impact this must have had on his life of watching Stephen and listening to what Stephen said. We're almost done. Verse 59. And while they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. What did Saul think there? He knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And after saying this, he died. What did Saul think then? He prayed. Three things. I want to give you this. Three things and a story and I'm done. Hang with me. Here's his witness. Number one, as we think about his witness, he was faithful. He was faithful, right? He was faithful unto death. Here is the criteria for success in God's economy. Are you listening? Here is the criteria for success in God's economy, be, being faithful unto death. It's not how much stuff you have, how big a stuff you have, the nicest stuff you have. It's about are you faithful unto death to the Lord Jesus. Secondly, he was forgiving. He was forgiving just like Jesus. He was forgiving the very ones that was killing him. Let me ask you this. Who is it you need to forgive? They haven't gone as far as they did with Stephen yet. We're still here living and breathing, right? Who is it that you've got that secret agenda? Eh, I remember what they did. Are you with me? I struggle too. Who do you need to forgive? It's just making you bitter and they probably don't even know it. Give it to Jesus. Forgiving. And, and then... He was focused. He was focused on Jesus. Here it is. Listen, I love the picture. I mean, they're, they're stoning him. I don't love that picture. But I mean, they're stoning They're killing him. And, and, but even before that, he said, he said, he said I, see, I see the Son of God, or the Son of Man. I see the Son of Man at the right hand, standing at the right hand of, uh, of the Father. And he saw that. And I saw, he was focused on Jesus. But, but, listen, listen, listen. Jesus was focused on him.
heard about a boy that made the high school football team. He was so excited. First game, his mama came out. Mamas always do, don't they? His mama came out to watch him play. And man, she sat in the stands. After the game was over, he went over. There was mama still sitting in the stands. He said, Mama, did you see me? She said, Yes, son, I did. You pulled your socks up 11 times. <laughs> and you managed to keep your uniform so clean, unlike all those other boys. He said, Oh, Mom. He said, I didn't even get in to play. She said, Son, I don't know anything about football, but I know about you. I didn't come here to watch a football game. I came here to watch you. And I thought, isn't that the picture here? <laughs> Stephen said, I see you. I see Jesus. But Jesus is already, I see you. And he sees you. Jesus sees us. He knows where you are today. He knows your heart. He knows the disappointments, the discouragement, the sin, all the hurts, habits, hang-ups. He knows that, doesn't he? And he loves us anyway. He sees you. And he loves you. Praise his name. Praise his name. May our witness be like that of Stephen. Faithful unto the end. Forgiving and focused on Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. Heads bowed, eyes closed as we come to a time of invitation. And, and just to think about even now in your heart today, let me just ask you, do you know the Lord? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And I know probably most in this room have. I don't know if everyone has. I can't see hearts, but... But you know, it's possible you could be here this morning and maybe you've never asked Jesus to come in and forgive you and save you. Why not today? Why not today? He, he did that perfect work on the cross. He shed his precious blood. We were singing about the blood earlier, weren't we? About the blood. It's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. Do you know him today? Do you know him as your Lord and Savior? Here's what, here's what I'm asking. Just to think, are you with me? Just to think, can you go back to a time that you turned from your sin and you placed your faith in Jesus and Jesus alone? You may not remember the time on the, on the calendar, but you remember a time that you asked Christ to save you. And if you don't have that time, what about today? Would you trust him today? I'll be right here in the front. Listen, uh, Brother Gary's up here. Lance is up here. We, we'd be glad just to to share with you about Jesus, how you can know him personally. It's just as simple as just trusting him, turning from your sin and asking him to come in and forgive you and save you. Listen, I encourage you to do that. For every believer here this morning, how's your witness? How's your witness? You know, we, I've talked about Stephen all morning, how that he was like Christ. And there were a lot of similarities. He wasn't perfect, but he was like Christ. Would your co-workers say that about you, that you're like Christ? Would your neighbors say that about you, that you're like Christ? Would your fellow students at school, students, would they say that about you, that you're like Christ? Has God put his finger on some things in our lives today? May we just give that to him. Father, right now, would you just speak to our hearts? Father, would you forgive us of those times that we fall short? Father, today, would you help us that our witness for you, our walk, our words, our life that we live would glorify you? Father, help us to be about sharing the gospel with those around us. Father, help us to forsake any sin in our hearts this morning, anything that we've excused or justified. Father, help us to mend any relationships today that needs to be mended. Help us to forgive and to show and offer forgiveness to others. Father, right now, just as we have this time, Lord, we just want to give our lives to you. We want to give our hearts to you. And it's in Jesus we pray. 
Amen. Let's stand together as we have a time of invitation. If you give us that chorus of that, please, sir. Give us a chorus first, if you will, please, sir. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood of life. the glory is the Lord. Amen. Whoever does the saving gets the glory. Glory to his name. I pray today that we would give glory to the one who loved you and me more than anything else, more than his own life, to be obedient to the will of the Father, to die for our sins that we might be saved. Oh, I pray you know him today. <laughs> I pray you know him today. He'll never let you down. He'll never leave you. He'll never never forsake you. People will let you down. I'll let you down. But the Lord never will. He'll never let you down. Amen.
Why don't y'all just sing that chorus one more time? Let's sing it together. Boy, that's just a beautiful sound, church. Let's sing it together. Y'all lead us. Glory to sing, his church. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Listen, we're glad you're here this morning, and uh, we appreciate you. Before you leave today, if you're able, we would ask that you would uh, stack the chairs for us eight high, I believe it is, and we appreciate the folks willing to do that. If you are a first-time guest, welcome, welcome. Stop by the table of all things. To my right, your left, and uh, if you haven't picked up a welcome gift, and we want to connect with you. So glad you're here today. It's good to be in the Lord's house. Let me pray for us, and we're going to go. How's that? Father, right now, would you just bless these, your people. Father, as we leave this place today, Lord, may we go out ready and willing to share with anyone that we come in contact with about the hope that we have in Jesus. Glory to your name, Father. And we ask it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. God Hey, thank you for worshiping with us today here at First Baptist Church. Listen, if we could be of service to you in any way, please don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, you can call our church office Monday through Friday. You can send us an email, a Facebook message. We would love to hear from you. Uh, so until next time, uh, let's keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith.